There are two things that the Buddha said are most conducive to awakening. Among external, external factors, they said the most useful thing is admirable friendship. Among internal factors, the most useful thing is appropriate attention. And so you want to understand what these are, so you can recognize them and make the best use of them. Admirable friendship means two things. One is having admirable people as friends, looking for people who are noble in their behavior. They have conviction in the Buddha's awakening, conviction in the, the principle of action that your actions are what shape your experience of pleasure and pain. They're virtuous, they're generous, and they're wise. They understand how to notice what's arising, what's passing away, and why things arise and why they pass away. Those are the kind of people you want to hang around. But you don't just hang around. You want to emulate their good qualities. This is the second aspect of admirable friendship, that you try to emulate their conviction, their virtue, their generosity, and their wisdom. And some of this is based on what you hear them say. And a lot of it is, though, is based on what you see them doing, the things you pick up. And you have to pick them up by being observant. It's not just that they say, well, you do this and you do that, and then you go out and you follow their, their words. You see how they behave in different circumstances. And that requires that you be sensitive. When I went back to Ordain in Thailand, John Fung told me, this is probably one of the first two weeks I was there. He says, you're going to have to learn how to think like a thief. Don't expect everything to be handed to you on a platter. In other words, he wasn't going to be explaining everything. A lot of it was up to me to see what he was doing and then to figure out why. That sort of teaching is very helpful if you handle it properly, and if you don't, you miss a lot, especially for those of us coming from another culture. It's very easy to say, well, they do things this way because that's what their culture is. But that's not what John Fung was talking about. He was talking about looking about why there's a good reason here, not just a cultural reason. You have to figure out, well, what are the good reasons? What could possibly be a good reason for this kind of behavior? And as you open up to that possibility, you learn a lot, both about your admirable friend and about yourself. And you learn a lot about skillful behavior. And you begin to realize there are many facets or many dimensions to a skillful action, just as there are many dimensions to an unskillful action. And John Mahabua tells of staying with a John Munn. And he was very determined to follow all the Dudanga practices, all the ascetic practices, to the letter. And at the beginning of the Rains Retreat, he'd see the other monks making vows that they were going to observe this practice and observe that practice, and then after all he saw them slipping off. And that made him more determined that he was not going to slip off like that, and he was going to stick right to the practice. And one of the practices was not accepting any food that was given after his alms round. He's very strict with himself about this. But every now and then, without warning, a John Munn would come past and slip a little food into his bowl. It's here, accept this as a gift from another contemplative, he'd say. And of course, being a John Mahabo's teacher, there was nothing really a John Mahabo could say. And he wondered, why would a John Munn do that? break his 
to Dhanga practice. And then he began to realize, well, there was some pride around the practice. And the purpose of taking on these practices is not to give rise to pride. It's basically to cut down in your defilements. So this was, way, this was a John Munn's way of making him think about it, to look at what was wrong with his practice. It was, wasn't discouraging him from taking on the practice and wasn't discouraging him from being strict, but he was telling him to watch out for that pride. And this is something you see across the board, what are called the customs of the noble ones. You learn how to be content with just whatever food you get, whatever clothing, whatever shelter. And you learn how not to exalt yourself or disparage others because you are more content than they are. In other words, you look for what might be the unskillful side on, of what on the surface seems to be skillful. You turn things over and look at them from many angles. In John Lee's words, you learn how to be a person with two eyes and not just one. And so Ajahn Mahabha was willingness to reflect on what good reasons did Ajahn Mahan have for doing this. It taught him some important lessons. If he hadn't reflected in that way, he just would have gotten upset. He wouldn't have learned anything. That's some of what it means to engage in admirable friendship. In other words, you don't just look for admirable friends, but you learn how to learn from an admirable friend. You learn how to look at your actions from many different sides. What may seem right on, from one angle is not quite so right from another. You learn how to look at things from all around. This, of course, relates directly to the internal factor, which is appropriate attention. The Buddha defines this in different ways, in different contexts, but primarily it's the ability to see things in terms of cause and effect, the actions you do, the results you get. And then figure out if you're doing something unskillful, how to drop that unskillful behavior and replace it with something more skillful. And the primary measure here is what's harmful and what's not. Basic distinction. And all too often we lose sight of the basic distinctions and we want to go into something more advanced. But actually, the more advanced practice comes out of looking more and more deeply into what's basic. Because you see there's a lot more depth in something simple like learning how to behave in a way that's harmless. You don't harm yourself, you don't harm other people. And that again requires that you look at things from many sides. Because sometimes harmless behavior may displease other people, but you can't take their pleasure or displeasure as your guide. just as it may please other people. Their pleasure is not any indication of whether they're being harmed or not, or whether you're harming yourself or not. You have to look very carefully. What are you doing? What are the immediate results? What are the long-term results? And you have to keep looking again and again and again at your actions, trying to be as observant as you can. And when you see that you've done something harmful, try to figure out a different way of doing it. This is where your ingenuity comes in. Both cases require that you be observant, both admirable friendship and appropriate attention. The admirable friendship is what gives you an outside perspective. You see someone else's example, you listen to them. That helps to take you out of your, your own preconceived notions, if you're willing to listen. 
And at the same time, you have to apply appropriate attention to that friendship to make sure that you really have chosen a good friend and that you really are using the friendship in the proper way. So these internal and external factors go together. They support each other. And they're all based on that willingness to learn. This is probably the first principle in, in wisdom, is the willingness to admit when you don't know something. And the willingness to admit, well, maybe I don't know something. Let's check this out. Let's look more carefully. It's easy to read the books and be able to analyze what's in the books. It's harder to see how what is in the books applies to what you're doing right now, because that has many more dimensions. The page, the written page, has two dimensions. Your computer screen has two dimensions. Life has many dimensions. And it's required that you look at things from all sides before you come to any conclusions. So this is one of the reasons why we're trying to get the mind still and trying to develop this all-around awareness. If you're too focused on one thing, there are other things you're going to miss. Like that video where they have people throwing a, a ball around a circle. And they tell you to look very carefully to figure out what the rules are of this game as they're throwing the ball back and forth. And you can look so intently at the ball that you miss the fact that somebody wearing a gorilla suit is walking right in between those people. Because you're so focused on the ball. So as you center the mind, remember you also want to develop an all-around awareness. That's what the description of the fourth jhana is. It's the body is filled with bright awareness. So that whatever comes up in any part of the body, you know. Whatever comes up in any part of the mind, you know. It's only when you see these things that you can do something about them. When you can realize, okay, there's something here that needs to be treated in a skillful way. And then it's your all-around awareness that helps you judge how skillful your initial response was. It's this kind of power of observation that allows you to practice on your own. It's developed in the context of admirable friendship, and it's always good to think we have admirable friends to rely on, teachers, fellow practitioners, to help show us aspects of ourselves we might have missed. But as you de develop in the practice, as you progress in the practice, you want to be more and more able to embody those different perspectives in yourself. This is especially necessary when you find yourself in a situation where there are really no admirable friends around. As the Buddha said, when you look around and you see nobody who's an admirable friend, you're better off practicing alone. Because at the very least you're not adding more wrong view on top of the wrong views you already have. So learn to develop this ability to look at your actions, look at their results, and see what's harmful, see what's not. It sounds simple, but if you really stick with it, that will take care of everything. Because what are the Four Noble Truths if they're not a, a more refined way of looking at what's harmful and what's not? Dependent core arising is a more refined way of looking at what's, what's harmful and what's not. get the mind into very subtle states of concentration. At that point, the word harm may seem a little bit too strong. 
but there are levels of disturbance. even in the most refined concentration. And it's the same process. You look to see what you're doing, and then you see if there's any disturbance. All too often it's easy when you get to really refined concentration to say, ah, this, this is it, the ground of being. Infinite space, infinite consciousness. But the Buddha has you look at it in terms of actions. What are you doing to stay tuned to that particular dimension? What perceptions are you holding in mind? To what extent do they disturb the mind? It's that same question again. What are you doing that's causing harm? Can you do something else? Can you learn at least how to stop doing the harmful thing? And you learn how to ask that question again and again and again. Get more sensitive to the different answers. And that is enough to take you all the way. This is why there are all those Ajans who had a minimum of formal education. But they were wise enough to realize if you stick with that one question, it doesn't matter what level of education you have. It's your sincerity and honesty and persistence in looking at that question and developing your sensitivity. That's what will bring results.